On the phone, we have a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. The greatest running back in college history and one of the greatest running backs in NFL history, Herschel Walker. How you doing, Herschel? I'm doing well. How you guys doing? Good. Great. I remember you playing in college. You were unstoppable. How did you end up going to Georgia? Was it just because you were from Georgia and that was basically a foregone conclusion? Uh, not really. I ended up flipping the coin. I uh, wanted to go to the military. I wanted to be a Marine. And uh, my mom, uh, you know, she always used to say that if your mind and your heart is true of the Lord Jesus, it doesn't matter about your decision. So I just ended up flipping a coin, and it came up for me to go to college. And I really didn't want to go to Georgia. So I ended up flipping a coin between those two to go to, and it came up to Georgia. So I reckon sometimes when you're naive and stupid, God will take care of you as well. Now, how, how how early in your life did you know that you were a good football player? Because uh, I think when you were young, you were a, he a heavy kid, right? I was. I was a little bit overweight. And uh, to be honest with you, I came from one of the smallest schools in the state of Georgia. And I didn't know whether I was a great football player because, you know, everyone always looked down on small schools and, and at the same time, I think I knew I was a good athlete because I was a track guy as well. And I was running track. And, you know, I was like beating most everybody in the state of Georgia so that I knew I could run. But, you know, just football, I, I just figured I was a decent football player. And I felt that if I ever can compete, I thought I could compete very well. I wish the Lord would have sent you to Notre Dame. You think he would have sent you there being a Catholic institution? Well, I think Notre Dame would have been a good place. We ended up beating them for the national championship, and <laughs> so that was a that was a. I did get an opportunity to play against them. I did. They they a very very good organization. They have a very very good school, and, and uh, you know I knew a lot of people that from Notre Dame. The Bob Crable and all those guys. They were very well coached. Very very a lot of discipline. What was the transition from uh, small town high school to the University of Georgia like for you? Well, you know, it was tough at first uh, because, you know, uh, Georgia is such a, a right here in my hometown, such a small place, and going to a big university like that. But what was made it easier for me is I had a sister at the time that was a, a few of the grade ahead of me, so she was already in college. And I had her, she was there, and a lot of the friends from, uh, a lot of the friends from, from my uh, hometown happened to get a scholarship at the University of Georgia, and they were there. So it made things a little bit easier for me, and I was able to uh, adjust well because, you know, I don't go out. I didn't drink and didn't go out partying, but I was able to uh, hang around a lot of the people that I already knew. What was your coach like at Georgia, Vince Dooley? Coach Dooley was a great man. Uh, he, was a, he was a military guy, so he was very disciplined. That was one thing he, he believed in, uh, being on a team. Is you gotta have discipline. Guys gotta uh, they gotta trust in each other. They gotta love each other. They gotta play together. You had to go to class. You had to be in class. You had to get grades, and and that's what uh, being a college uh, athlete student was all about. It wasn't just about uh, football. And what was so strange about it is you can ask Coach Dooley today. I was very fortunate to play as a freshman there at the, on the University of Georgia because he really do not believe freshmen should play the first year. He feel that they should get acclimated to uh, college and uh, really go to class, get their grades up, and play that sophomore year. And I think it was just lucky that I got an opportunity to play my uh, freshman year. Did they explain all that to you coming in? Because you, you were like no, the most sought-after player coming out of high school and then to, to find yourself not not playing? No, he didn't explain that to me uh, when I first came in. And a matter of fact, uh, I think when I signed, it was after I signed, he really questioned whether I can even play there. I think that was a question mark in his mind because he wasn't really sure I was up for that type of competition, he said. And he questioned uh, whether I can play, which was kind of weird because, you know, growing up a little bit overweight, having a speech impediment, a lot of people always question who you are, what you are, what you can do, and, and all that. So it was kind of strange. I thought I already made it to the top to get a scholarship, and then uh, the coach that I just signed to go to is questioning whether I can play. When did he decide that you can play? 
Well, he didn't decide I can play until uh, I think probably halfway through the second quarter in the first game. I think the running back coach almost begged him to give me an opportunity to get in the game uh, because he was not going to let me play. He just felt that at that time uh, he wanted to wait. And I think that running back coach, Coach uh, Mike Cavan, went to Coach uh, Dooley and just begged Coach Dooley at that time, uh, put her in. And that's when he decided to put me into the game, and I played. Now, you spoke about being overweight and having a speech impediment when you were young. Did kids make fun of you because of oh, yes, that? Oh, yes, they did. Yes, and they did. How, 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 how did you deal with that? You know, that was that was very hard to deal with at first. They made a lot of fun of me at that time. Uh, and it, it, I, it was, I, I sort of recruited to a shale for a little while. Uh, because, you know, I was a little bit intimidated and, you know, being overweight, not that athletic, you know, a lot of people not going to give that time of day. So for about four years, I never even went out for a recess. You know, I stayed in class and didn't feel good about myself and all of that. So it was kind of hard at first. And then it just got to a point where I just got fed up. And I think that's where everybody got to get to that point in their life. They just got to get fed up. And they got to say that they're not going to take it anymore. And, uh, and, and they're either going to fight back or they're going to end up hurting themselves or doing something against someone else. And I just it was very fortunate that I, I got fed up and I just started training, started going to the library, getting books, started reading, and I really just started teaching myself. Did you take speech classes in grade school or high school? Uh, I did take some speech classes in uh, grade school. So I, I worked on uh, a lot of speech classes, and a matter of fact, even when I got to high school, I continued to take a couple of speech classes. Uh, you know, one of the things that was it's funny, I uh, remember telling one of my speech coaches, uh, if I can change my dialect, I don't know if he would even change my dialect. And he said, no, Herschel, uh, you have a voice that people trust. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you have a, bo- a voice like a Baptist preacher. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, people trust your voice. I said, I'm a con artist. He said, yeah, you can say that. Because I went through the same thing in grade school. I had a speech impediment. My mom said, you're going to learn how to talk because if you don't get rid of this, it's going to hinder you, your self-confidence, and your ability to succeed. Well, no, that's exactly right. And because people are going to look down on you at that time. And, and at first, that would teach you look down on me. And, you know, I became graduate in my class. But what was weird is uh, a lot of teachers during early on used to just put me in a corner. You know, they just said, well, you know what, he'll learn sometime or whatever. But they didn't give me that much time, the time of day. And that's why I, today I go out and I try to help people that are going through any kind of mental or physical problems. Or, and that's the reason I work with our military or work with anyone that's being bullied. Because, you know, that's, it, you know the people don't realize how, how painful or how hurtful that can be. Yeah, well, I had a speech impediment when I was uh, a youngster, too. But once you're able... To get to to get past that, you do have a certain sense of accomplishment, and and all of a sudden your self esteem, you know, lifts, and and you feel pretty good about yourself. It, it, you know, it, it it says I can do something, not quite on my own, but with the help of somebody else, and it it just opens a whole new world to you. No, it does. You know, it's sort of like uh, you know being uh, it's like you can see now. I tell everyone is like open up an opportunity where now you can start seeing where before you could never uh, you couldn't understand things, but now you got an opportunity where you can understand things. So your freshman year goes pretty good, and you end up in the uh, Sugar Bowl. What what sort of experience was that like? Oh, hello there. That's no problem. Yeah, say that again now. Say that again. Your you freshman that. year ended up pretty good. You guys, you know, win the SEC championship yet. If you face uh, Notre Dame in the Sugar Bowl, what was that experience like? Well, I, I absolutely loved it. I, I feel everyone, people talk about uh, what's my favorite uh, time of year was my favorite football memory. 
I go back to that Notre Dame game, and not just a Notre Dame game, it's my freshman year, because, and not that we won at a game or we beat Notre Dame for the national championship, but I think that's where I became a a guy to understand that if you work as a team, I don't care whether it's in football and business and life, you work as a team, we can accomplish a lot of things. And because at the University of Georgia, we were not the most talented football team in college football. We were not the biggest. We were not the fastest. But one thing about it is we loved each other. We played as a unit. And we kind of got the job done. And I think when you look around at football today, you see a lot of teams that's playing together so well. And they're gelling. They're, made, they're winning. And that's what it takes. It doesn't matter that you got all the talent on that team. What matters is you got to play together. Everyone has got to be on the same page. And that's what it was with, uh, with us. Now, in that game, you rushed 36 times for 150 yards, and early on, you dislocated your shoulder. How, how, yes, how, how, how were you able to do that? Well, you know, what was strange about it is uh, being a little naive and stupid sometimes, when I dislocated my shoulder, they told me that uh, that I couldn't play anymore, and I couldn't understand the reason why. And uh, they said, well, your shoulder's out of place. And I said, well, if it's out of place, I mean, you can put it back. And they said, it takes surgery to put that back. And I said, surgery didn't take it out. So I, uh, it hurt worse being out than it did then putting it back. So that was one reason I had them to put it back in place. I felt that it would feel much better to put it back. So going into the 81 season, did you guys, were you guys fairly confident, hey, we're national champs, we can do this thing again? Well, I think we were confident that now we knew we could play. And I think that's what, what it takes, and I, and I tell this people this all the time, the difference between athletes or, or success is so minute, it's so small, but you got to believe it. I think it starts upstairs. you got to believe it enough that you're going to go out and you're going to work your tail off because it's going to take that. You know, you're not just going to show up and be born with athletic ability. you got to get out and you got to work it. you got to nurture it, and I think that's what it did to us. We just started believing that we can win games. We started believing that we can beat almost anybody, but we had to work at it. And once again, the season ends with you guys in the Sugar Bowl, this time against Pitt and a quarterback by the name of Dan Marino with a little different result. Yes. Well, watch you on the sidelines as, as Marino was quarterbacking. Could you, did you say to yourself, this guy's pretty good. He, he, oh, he no, might have I a career in Marino. college. Yeah, yeah, we knew he was pretty good. And what was so strange about it, and when people look back at that game, we had him beat. We totally had Pittsburgh beat. And I think it was uh, it was fourth and about 20. And it was strange. The clock was winding down, and we blitzed. And we were winning the game, and... Dan Marino, the great quarterback that he was, uh, stepped back and hit the tight end right down the middle for a touchdown, ended up beating us. And that's what's so strange about it. You gotta be on, on your point all the time. And you know, it took someone like Dan Marino to beat us, I hope I hope I can say that. Nineteen eighty two comes along and here's Herschel Walker with what a, a fractured thumb. Before the season starts, do you figure you were out for a month or so? No, I, I really didn't. I, uh, you know, I'm one of these players that you, you, sometimes you got to play injured. And, you know, I thought I can play injured with that big cast on my hand, you know, the first game. We had uh, Electron, as we call him, that was playing, and I thought I can play a little bit. So I thought it was going to be okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we had a lot of confidence in that team. We have been winning. We knew how to win. We knew what it take, and and everybody seemed to step up when someone else goes down. So I just I just felt I'd be let back, and I'd be back in there swinging at it again. And you guys win your third SEC championship in three seasons. You figured that this is this is pretty routine stuff, right? Well, you know, we did. We we felt we we were going to win, and we felt that we had the ability to win. And, and that's what we set out to do. Uh, but at the same time, we sort of knew that it was going to take work. You know, when you play, uh, when you have people like Alabama that's going to be lurking in at LSU, you had to worry about those teams. And so uh, we felt that if we can go out and be who we needed to be, then we're going to be okay. And uh, and that's what we did. 
And so you guys play Penn State uh, for the national championship, and yeah. Penn State ends up winning twenty seven twenty three. Yeah. Did, did you know at the time that that was going to be it for for you in the college ranks? I uh, know I didn't. You know what was so strange about it is uh, when I got back to the University of Georgia. Uh, that's when I heard about this USFL thing, and I ended up slipping a coin again. Go to the USFL or stay in college, and uh, send in my ex-wife and I, we were sitting in my apartment. We flipped the coin. It came to go to the USFL, and, and, and we left. So you, you end up at, with the New Jersey Generals. What, what was the transition like from Athens, Georgia, to going uh, to New Jersey? Now, that was tough. That was hard because, you know, New York is a big place. Uh, you know, New York is a big, big place, but it, it made things a little uh, easier for me because my ex-wife is from Brooklyn. She had family members up in New York and New Jersey, so, uh, you know, sort of like I had people that I knew, and, and also I was working with Adidas a great deal, and a lot of the guys that I knew were there in the New Jersey area, so they had to make the transition a little bit easier for me, but you know, being up in the Big Apple is a, is a, it's a tough place, but the people are a little bit easier. Was the transition in terms of football easy or difficult going to the professional level? Uh, you know, that was difficult because now you're stepping up to another uh, sort of level. You're stepping up to a level where, uh, you know, and I tell people this, you go from college to, from high school to college, Everyone on that college team got a scholarship because they have their athletic ability. Now you go to uh, pro ball, professional ball. Now you step up to another elite uh, set of talents. So it made things a little bit harder, but at the same time, I continue to work, work hard. And that's what I tell people all the time. You have to work. Even when you're a pro uh, football player, you just don't want to practice and go home. When you go home, sometimes you may have to do a little extra running. Sometimes you have to do a little bit extra work because you got to have a little bit more to bring to the table because everybody on that team is pretty good. USL eventually folded, and you end up with the the Dallas Cowboys. Was that where you wanted to be? Well, you know, I told you my best way I play. You know, I didn't really follow football that much. But I had two brothers that loved the Dallas Cowboys, and I felt I loved to play in Dallas. I didn't think that I would because uh, Tony Dorsett, but I was very fortunate that uh, Tex Ram called me up, and he said, oh, should we just draft you for the Dallas Cowboys? And I had a chance to go there and play for, uh, I think, one of the finest coaches ever to coach football, Tom Landry, and play with uh, you know some Hall of Fame guys, the Randy White, the Tony Dorsett, the Ed Tito Jones, the Danny White. Well, I got a chance to play with some guys that, uh, that you know, I, I think are absolutely incredible that even taught me even more about professionalism. Yeah. You mentioned Tony Dorsett. You and he ended up in the same backfield. That, that's, not, that's, that's not too bad to have a couple, uh, <clears throat> couple of phenomenal runners like that. No, it's not, not bad at all. And, you know, and being with Tony, I tell people all the time, I watch Tony play with injuries. And that's what's so amazing. That this guy went out, well, Randall White, this guy went out when he was, like, as injured and he played. And that showed the type of player that he was, whereas today you have some guys that get a little hangnail and they don't want to do anything. But, you know, I watch guys play. Randall White play with a broken hand. And, and, you know, and the guy have two or three sacks in a game and never, never saw him complain. They showed up to, uh, to work every day, and they worked. They were not a guy that was on the sideline or over on the, uh, standing out there watching everyone else practice. These are older guys right there practicing, and they were working. Now, you ended up dancing with the Fort Worth Ballet? Yes. yes. How did that come about? Well, you know, I, took, I had taken ballet when I was in college a little bit during the uh, sort of off-campus. Uh, you know, I've been in martial arts. I, I was fighting, and people don't know this, I fought in martial arts tournament, uh, like on Sunday at the church, when I was playing there at Georgia. I used to go to church Sunday morning and go fight a martial arts tournament uh, Sunday afternoon. And one day uh, I felt that ballet didn't help give me flexibility. So I got into uh, with the ballet and uh, got where 
I, I liked it. It helped my flexibility out with ballet. It was very difficult. People think ballet is easy. Ballet is very, very difficult. And uh, when I got to Texas, the Fort Worth Ballet knew that I had danced a little bit, and they asked if I'd do a thing uh, with them to help raise money. And, uh, and, you know, me being such a guy to always say, I do it, I do it, I do it. I said, yes, I do it. So as a practice, I would go to Fort Worth and uh, train with the ballet company there to do this uh, routine with them. And every day I would go, coming back home, I, I would tell myself, I need to get out of this. I got to get out of this. This is so hard. But then something else would say, you know what, Hershey, you never give enough. You got to keep doing it. So I end up dancing with the Fort Worth Ballet. Did your teammates make fun of that or anything? Or, or did they understand that ballet dancing uh, you know, requires an awful lot of athleticism? Uh, well, they made fun of it at first. But people knew that I was a sort of different kind of guy. And then they uh, they uh, sort of accepted that and they knew ballet was hard because I told them it was hard and they saw the way I had practiced. So they knew if I was saying that it was difficult, it had to be hard. After uh, Tony Dorsett gets traded by Dallas t to Denver, then all of a sudden it, it becomes the uh, the Herschel Walker show down in, in Cowboy Land. Was that... Liberating for you as as a player to not have to share that backfield with him? Uh, not at all, uh, because you know, I love Tony. Tony and I was roommate in uh, in training camp, and Tony really was helping me out a great deal to adjust to Dallas, adjust to professionalism, and and to see him go was hard. And you know, a lot of people didn't know, but you know, my first year at Dallas under Coach Landry, I broke the receiving record for the Dallas Cowboys as a receiver. So I was playing out wide. I was doing a lot of different things. And I tell people, uh, 20 years to fail probably was a blessing to me because people saw that I can do a lot of different things. I was just not, quote, a running back. And I think being in Dallas, they gave me an opportunity to play wide out, to play full back, to play running back. And I was being moved around a great deal, which I enjoyed doing, and having Tony on the team because, you know, you never know what that guy going to do. You went to the Pro Bowl in 87 and 88, and then in 1989, you, you get traded to, to Minnesota for, you know, five players. D did you see that deal coming? Not at all. You know, that was a deal that was done, and like I said, I, I had no clue that was going to happen. And, and when it was done, you know, it was sort of shocking uh, because, you know, I was doing so well in Dallas, and now I'm going up to Minnesota to play, and, and, and so, you know, you make your home in, in Texas. So to go to a whole different place, that's a tough place. And uh, not a tough place, but it's a tough tough pill to swallow. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that much about Minnesota. You know, I was happy in Dallas. And, but then for me to continue to play, I knew that I had to, uh, had to go ahead and go along with the trade. Which was hard because the I think the Vikings coaches never knew that there was even a trade in the world. They didn't find out that was a trade until Herschel Walker was showing up in uh, in Minnesota. So that was a tough, tough uh, uh, place for them to be put in as well. Not just losing all the players, but losing a lot of draft picks as well. While you were with the Vikings. You joined the United States Bobsled and Skeleton Federation. How did that come about? Uh, you know, I was, I was always competing in the Superstars during the off-season. You know, I won the Superstars a couple of times. And Willie Gold asked me about being on the Bobsled team. And Herschel was always saying, okay, I'd do it, I'd do it. Said that I would, I would do it. And when he uh, decided to, uh, when he decided to uh, go join the Bobsled team, uh, or try for the team in Lake Placid, New York, he asked if I'd go up there and do it as well. And I said, okay. And I went up to Lake Placid, New York, ended up being qualified to be on the team. And then we ended up flying off to Altenburg, Germany to try for the, like, the push championship for the United States. Well, I ended up winning the push championship, which meant that I had to be on a sled. So that's how I ended up on the United States bobsled team. You, you eventually, you know, Played for the for the Eagles and the Giants, and uh, back again with the Cowboys. At, at what point did you decide? Okay, th th this is enough of the NFL career. 
Well, you know, I think my my second year back with the Cowboys, uh, people started calling me Mr. Walker. <laughs> it was funny because you know, I played with Tony Dorsett, and then all of a sudden uh, Tony's son was playing with Oakland Raiders, and then yeah, Ron Spring's son playing with the Washington Redskins. John Casey is playing with the Carolina uh, Panthers. These are little kids that I used to play with on the floor, and now they're in the league uh, playing. And I had been around for such a long time, and I started thinking, is it time for me to get out of the league? And Which was weird because if people think right, that's when I was returning kickoff for the Cowboys, and I think I was probably leading the league in kickoff return. But I just felt that this is no one else's game, so I would walk away from the game. At the time. And you were playing some tight end too, right? I was playing tight end. I was playing in a lot of different positions there as well. Was the transition from football player to normal human being easy or difficult? Uh, you know, I think for me it was it was easier because you know I was doing so many different things. So at that time I was still I was working. I had some companies. I was, and I think that's been what's been great for me is I've been uh, working almost all my life. I've been doing something almost all my life where it, I'm always I'm always I'm always staying busy. And I think it's hard if I hadn't had anything there because, you know, you have athletes that grow up, that's all they do is play football. That's all you're doing is playing football. And when you walk away from the game and you got nothing there to do, that's very difficult. Whereas I had a lot of things that I was doing and, and it kept me busy where I wouldn't have to go home and just think. I'm just sitting on the couch thinking about football. You know, they kept me busy with whatever I was doing at that time. Was your running style comparable to Jim Brown more, or you're more like uh, Earl Campbell type? Well, you know, it's hard to say. Yeah, I never watched uh, Jim Brown play because I never really followed football that much, and I thought Earl Campbell, and I still think Earl Campbell was one of the best guys ever to play. He ran the ball very, very physical. He ran the ball very physical. He ran the ball very physical, and uh, what was so strange about it is uh, – I, I think I may have been a mixture of both because of my speed and my strength that I can do almost uh, both things. So I think that was it more than anything. Okay. Now, if I understand correctly, you have the mental condition dissociative identity disorder. At, at what point does that get diagnosed and how, how do you deal with that? Well, you know what was so strange? I didn't know what was really happening to me until uh, my... Uh, Ex-wife was telling me that when I got out of football, I was I was acting so different, and I don't understand that. But then in my business, I could see how I just was so uh, sort of so aggressive on point. I wanted people on time. I wanted things just done so right because you know that's the way I lived in football. You gotta go. You gotta do. It, you gotta do it. Nothing that ever uh, you can't like you can't say you're sorry because when you're forming that ball, you can't worry about it. You gotta keep going. You gotta keep going. And then I started displaying that uh, outside of, uh, you know, in my business life, in my home life. And that's when I figured that I, something was wrong. And I turned and, and found a doctor that diagnosed me as having this social identity disorder, which I can understand that because, you know, like I'm Herschel Walker. You know, I don't drink. I don't do anything crazy. And, uh, and I never took a drug. And so I was like, this doctor's got to be wrong until he started going over my symptoms and started talking about everything. And, and that's when it started going back to my childhood, being bullied and being picked on, being always put down. And that's where I saw that uh, my, uh, I used uh, this football, this athletic world as my coping mechanism, where I was coping with a lot of different things. And I used my coping mechanism so much that now I don't have an athletic world as my coping mechanism anymore. So when I look around to say where well, I'm going to display all that that that, that aggressiveness, where it's going to be at, going to be on my loved one in my business life, and that's when I went off to a hospital because I wanted to understand that, and I got help there, and then that's when I learned that we all fall short of the glory of God, that we all have problems, that we all are suffering from something, but some people try to hide it, and I wrote the book then to uh, try to explain it to a lot of people that may have been hurt and a lot of people that may have been ashamed that I wasn't ashamed. I'm not ashamed of that because I know that we all have problems. And uh, I think from there, uh, my life continues. 
Do you think that you would have been the all-time leading rusher in NFL history if you would have played with the Cowboys like Emmitt Smith did behind that line? You know, it, it's hard to say. And, you know, I never try to say you could or you would or all that. You know, I, I think I would have done well. You know, you look at my career right now, and I was telling someone this the other day when they were talking about the Hall of Fame, and I said, guys, if you just take away my years of fail, don't even look at my years of fail. And I said, just look at what I've done the – time when I had the opportunity and I'm still ranked for the high when you combine all my yards with receiving with this thing. I've had over five hundred catches for running bikes. I've done all those things. And, you know, whether I would have had more yards, you know, who knows? I may have gotten injured. You know, uh and so I, I I don't think like that. I just said it, you know, I think I had a great career. I, I enjoyed it. I had a lot of great coaches that really done a lot of great things for me. And that was important. Was there one run that you made that stands out? <laughs> I know you had a lot of them. Uh, yes, you know, I think I was in Atlanta, and I think I had a 90-yard catch, a 90-yard run, and a 90-yard kickoff return. And I think that stands out a little bit because that's the first time anyone has ever done that. And being back home uh, in Georgia, for the people to see that, uh, you know, their, uh, their son is still doing his thing, I think it was important. If you were to race during your prime against Bo Jackson in his prime, who would have been faster? No, oh, there's no doubt I'm faster. And uh, Bo may say the same thing, but you go to the track, you go to the track records, and you know people have said all these times that everybody have, but you know I'm living proof. I got it. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm I'm still doing my thing. Bo still doing his. There's not a doubt. I, I, I'm faster. Now you you were on the. Uh television show Celebrity Apprentice and and got fired by Donald Trump who used to be your boss when you were at the in the USFL. What, what yeah. was that experience like? Well, you know, it, it was strange. I didn't know that much about the show. I, I love being on the show. Uh, Miss Rivers, Joan Rivers, I actually love her, Jesse James. I love him. Uh, and, you know, Donald, I've known Donald forever and uh, Ivanka and little Donald, you know, I, I used to take them to the zoo and all around. So it was great being on the show, but then Donald fired me. I'm like, what? You can't fire me. But you know, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And then I stayed. They wanted me to stay and uh, to help Joan, which was uh, even better because she ended up winning it all. She won when she beat the uh, poker player, Annie. I can't uh, Annie. Annie, Annie, Yeah, Annie Duke. I was rooting for Annie Duke. I'm not a big Joan Rivers fan. <laughs> well, you know what's so funny? You, you Annie, Annie did some absolutely amazing things to have people to come in to bring the money that she brought in because she raised more money than anyone on that show. And at that time, she raised more money than anyone had raised uh, on the Celebrity Apprentice. And, you know, that was absolutely amazing. And Annie Duke did an incredible, incredible job and stuff, and, uh, and you know, you can't take anything away from me. The only reason I said I wanted Joan to win is we were on the team together. And I actually love Ms. Rivers. It, it's funny because I watch her uh, in front of, you know, you watch people outside of the cameras, and she was absolutely an amazing woman because she was the way she was on camera and the way she was in life. She took care of every fan. She talked to everyone. She was on time. She showed a professionalism that I've known all my life, and that's what I try to tell everyone now in business or in anything. You got to be a professional. You cannot just think that you can do things some of the time without doing it all of the time. What gave me a sour taste with her is when her daughter got kicked off. It was kind of like you kicked my daughter off. Now I'm going to quit because I don't like the way you treated my daughter. Yeah, she got upset, which is good. That's not her mom. You know, that's her mama bear taking care of her, but she did end up staying. And uh, and Melissa, I tell you, Melissa, it's funny. Melissa, she's very talented in her own. She's a lovely woman, beautiful little boy. And uh, and I'm I'm glad to see Joan like that. I hope my mom would be like that too. If anything happened to her son, she'd say, "Hey, I'm not going to do that." Man. So what do you do nowadays to remain uh, busy? Well, you know, busy going to freak you out today. You know, I own the largest minority on chicken company in the United States. Uh, I have also a promotion company. I have a tech company where I'm the first, we have the first ever patented video that you can do e-commerce off the video without leaving the video. And it, it will be out very soon called Sensei. And uh, I'm also, I work with all military service men and women. I go to about two bases a month all over the world. 
talking to them through the uh, Warriors in Transition about uh, the different uh, the traumatic stress syndrome, anything that's suffering through mental, chemical, or anything like that. Uh, and, you know, we, I work with Universal Health System out of Philadelphia. We treat about four to 600 military service men and women from all over the world that suffer from anything. So, uh, and I have about 800 employees. So I've been very fortunate. So do you supply Chick-fil-A and the Colonel with chicken? I, I don't do Chick-fil-A. Uh, even though I know the Catholic family, I know them very well. And I also do a, a motorcycle ride across America for the Kyle Peter Charity Ride, which uh, helps a lot of chronically ill kids. There's a camp in Random, North Carolina, where we bring kids in, and it's all free. They're there for a week. They're chronically ill, where they may get an opportunity to go to a Disney World. They can come to this camp. We have doctors and nurses and everyone there on staff. So I do a motorcycle across the uh, country in May. So we're going from San Diego all the way to uh, Savannah, Georgia. Uh, we have about 100 to 200 bikes. So if anyone that wants to do that can go on the website and do a motorcycle ride with us. So I'm doing that as well. And I have a 14-year-old little boy. So I'm trying to be a dad. So we have uh, another running back coming up? Well, uh, you know, I've told him whatever he does, I'm going to love him. I don't care what he does. I love him like crazy. He's my little man. Uh, you know, he's he's running track and he's doing a lot of other things and stuff. Well, I don't think there'll be ever, ever be another Herschel Walker. I, I, I think uh, you, you were a once-in-a-lifetime well, player. Well, thank you. You know, I, I tell kids all the time, I say, be the best you can be. That's what's so funny about it. Is there a lot of talented people out there? And I tell people, you just got to work. You know, I'm doing the MMA fighting. You've got about that. You know, I've been doing the MMA fighting. I absolutely love it. A lot of the guys there said, Herschel, you know, we weren't even born when you were playing. But, you know, I keep myself in great shape. Uh, I, I'm always working out. I'm always running. I'm running my business. And, and, and that's what it is. I said, if I got all these personalities, maybe they need to hire me to be a Congress person because I got so many personalities where I can cut the budget down. Having so many people, <laughs> trying to take care of a lot of things. You're you're absolutely right. I mean, you did it all. Yeah. And you keep busy because if a busy person stays out of trouble. Now, well, that's exactly right, and that, and I think that's what athletes got to do is keep themselves busy. If you got the talent to play in professional sports, I don't care where it's at. You got the talent to do other things because you know the work ethic is that it takes. And I tell people that all the time. We got to work. You know, just in talking about our politicians, you know, my thing is with them and don't get mad at me, but I said, when are we going to get rid of that elephant and that darn donkey and start doing what's best for this country rather than what's best for a party? Right now, this country is suffering. Our kids are suffering, so we got to think about them and do what's best for this country. Maybe you and Charles Barkley could run on a ticket. Well, maybe we can run together. Charles will be vice president. I'll be president. Uh, I don't know if Charles would settle for that. <laughs> you guys might have to thumb wrestle for who's on top of that ticket. Uh oh. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure talking to you. Are you working now? Thank you. Thank you. Are sir. you working? God Bye. bless you guys. God bless you. You too. All right.